we go. So this is my uh, third time uh, presenting at the Victoria University of Wellington. And this time uh, I want to put all that you've learned because I, I know that you've already had a full day. Um, I'm going to put that a little bit in a global perspective because uh, I happen to think that's imperative in your kind of jobs these days. Um, I started my career in finance. Then after the global financial crisis, I went into regulation. Um, and uh, I am quite aware of a lot of the details that you probably went over earlier, uh, especially about complex products. But these days I'm, I'm working a little bit more on uh, the global level, interconnectedness. Um, so that's what I do now. I live in the United States and I work at KPMG and I help companies make use of interconnectedness. And I studied, uh, and uh, coming across that, I, I was trained as an econometrician. And then I noticed that a lot of patterns are quite unsustainable. Uh, we, can't keep, we can't keep doing it like that. So I went back to school. So now I'm writing my thesis at Harvard in sustainability uh, with a focus on economy. So before we start, I want to do a quick poll. It's very easy. You have the choice of two worlds. They are identical except for one thing. In world one, you earn 150,000 this year and next year you earn 200,000. And in world two, you earn 200,000 this year and next year you will earn 150,000. Which world do you prefer? Um, and Melanie, could you let me know um, how many counts we have just in case I don't quite jot it down correctly. We're just going to do simple hand raising. So who prefers world one? And who prefer, uh, oh wait, I see, I see <laughs> two hands, is that correct? Four, four. four hands, thank you. And, and then um, how many do we have for world two? <laughs> That's the rest, um, which is Melanie six. All right, thank you. It's a little, it's a small screen. All right, we'll come back to that later. So I'm not going to go into this too much. Um, I'm assuming that you are aware of the global financial crisis and what happened. Either you lived through it, like I did, or uh, you uh, and or you've studied it extensively at school. So, but we know it happened, and there were a couple. Of, there were many lessons from it, and I'm going to go over a couple of lessons that I think maybe haven't quite gotten the attention that, that I think they should have. And these insights, they come from basically this phenomena. This is a, uh, these are obviously, these are the big banks that you all know. And these are the figures on the right that their models, in this case, the VAR model, value at risk, predicted that they would suffer at maximum in 2007, so on their market positions. So Citigroup thought that with 99% certainty, they would not lose more than two and a half billion. And these were the actual figures that year. So they were off by about a hundred billion dollars. So I think and a couple of other people thought you, you, you can't just look at this and say, well, that then was the 1%. That was a 27 standard deviation anomaly. And that was it. I think this shows that we've missed something. So if you go to the root causes of the global financial crisis, I think there are three things. First, there was leverage in the system. This has been acknowledged. Um, I'm going to move this because I want you to see this paper. I'm not going to go into it, but it's an interesting paper. Um, we, when we talk about leverage in the system, there are many ways that we have leverage, obviously. There's the leverage of when you don't you don't hold one one capital. That's not how you make money as a bank. Uh, so, but that does um, uh, that's what a bank does. But to which extent you hold capital, obviously uh, that that creates a certain kind of leverage. That's why we increase the capital charges after the financial crisis. But there's another kind of leverage, obviously, with the introduction of complex products because they derive their price from other financial products and not not from anything in the real economy. And I think that's very interesting. And if you put that in a bigger perspective, really how, if you look throughout history, what humankind has built in the financial sector was really built on a, on a 
pretty steady pyramid where at, for a long time we had this base of natural capital and we had this linear production model of extraction use and then we would let it go, we would discard it. And then on top of that, we built society. On top of that, we built an economy. And then on top of that, we had the point of the pyramid, which was the financial sector, which is really meant to be the blood of the economy. So it transports money where it's a surplus to where it's needed as investment so we can produce more things. But I think now the, the size of the financial sector is multiple times the country's GDP. So it's really, and we're running out of natural capital because of our production, our population, and our use has increased not linearly, but exponentially. So what we now have is, is a really a broad base of the financial sector. And under that is a smaller economy, the real economy. And under that, we have a shrinking base of social capital, which I will go into later, partially as a result of income inequality. And under that, we have an increasingly small base of natural capital. So you can see how that is less stable. I think that's leverage as well. But going back to the other two, uh, looking at risks in isolation and internally, I think that is what we're still doing. When I was um, in the, the BCBS work stream for uh, the new framework for securitizations, we focused on credit risk. And then another colleague of mine was working with other central banks colleagues on liquidity. And another one was working on market risk. But what we saw in the GFC really was it started with credit risk, uh, going into mortgages with then spread into securitizations. Um, and then that credit risk spun into market risk, which is really multiples of the credit risk that was, that was in the securitizations. And then that spread into other assets, and then you had, because of these fire sales, until the liquidity dried up. Then we had the economy grinding to a halt, which then of course led to more credit defaults because people were losing their, um, their jobs. So they couldn't pay off other loans, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a cluster of risks and they are incredibly interactive, yet we still look at them and try to mitigate them in isolation. I, I, think, I don't think we've really gotten around to changing that very much. Uh, and the third one is this blind reliance on models that what we saw, this, this VAR model, I think many banks are still using it. They've, they've gone on to scenario analysis for sure, uh, uh, that kind of things, but we still use them a lot. Um, and the thing with these models is, is that they only use past data for the very obvious reason that we do not have data on the future. So you have to realize though that that assumes constancy. And then I'm not even talking about the assumptions that are very typical for these models, which is normally distributed errors, independence, uh, homoscedasticity. There's really no reason to assume all those things in the real world. Most processes in the real world are not like that. They're mostly logistic, exponential, logarithmic. There hardly anything is ever linear in the world. And nobody assumes that. Nobody assumes that because you gr grew at a certain rate at the age of two, that you will continue growing that until the rest of your life. But for some reason, we looked at securitizations and we thought, well, it's never shown any losses in the past, so naturally it will not occur in the future because that's why the credit charges were so low. So why did we do that? And I think one of the reasons, one of the key insights on this is that they were created in an unusually stable period, these models. But this is from the book, This Time is Different, from Carmen Reinhardt, who did in a very rigorous study into two centuries of financial crises. It's really quite impressive. And an interesting thing, and the book is called This Time is Different, because what she found was that we say this every time, just before a financial crisis. We say, well, this time we've learned from the past, our regulations are enough, and we know how to do it now. We know what works and we know what doesn't. There are certain safe assets in there and there aren't. And, and in which there are, we can model the risk. And there's really no reason to assume that. The only reason that we have that illusion is because the models were made in this uh, period after the Second World War, which is the Bretton Woods period, which is a period of unusual stability. If you look at that, we, we, we didn't really have those few decades with almost no banking crisis throughout history. 
we also, and one of the reasons I think is for, because of what the other line indicates, the dashed one, which stands for capital mobility, which is an approximation or an indication of our financial interconnectedness. So capital mobility was very low. We were still on the gold standard. We had fixed currencies mostly. So there wasn't a lot of complexity in the system. But it's not the world we live in today. We are very, very connected today. This is, this is a typical uh, bank balance in the Bretton Woods period, uh, UK bank. And you see here that this is what a bank used to be and what a lot of people still think of when they think of a bank, a commercial bank. So you take deposits from people, you take people's savings, and then you invest it into uh, other uh, uh, people who need it, for example, because they want to start their own little shop. And now, these days, they're a lot more complex, but also deposits actually are a minority of what's on the balances of banks. There's a lot of interconnectedness with other banks and other big corporations and also the products they invest in are way more complex and way more diverse. This is not necessarily a bad thing, by the way. Um, it's just, it does make things more interconnected and more complex. Um, this one is a network map from uh, FedWire. Uh, the, inter, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, Interbank Payment Network with about 10,000 participants. So when we talk about a network in the real world, a network is almost never random. So you have these hubs and this has been extensively studied by central banks since the GFC because of contagion. They noticed that there were a couple of banks and when they did something, it spread through the system beyond what anybody really had expected. So. Uh, the central banks have been studying interconnectedness in that sense a lot when it comes to financial sector. So the interconnectedness between banks. So I think you're getting my point. We're incredibly interconnected. And what that means is everything is more dynamic. Complexity does not mean we have just mean we have more players. It changes the behavior of the system. So this is again the Bretton Woods period. And you see that there were very little, there was very little trade to begin with there again. And then when, when more trade partners were added, this is from the Eurozone, by the way, this is not the world. But the point is that once people started to, countries started to trade more, it, it didn't just become more, it became more dynamic. These swings up and down are literally off the chart. I did not crop it like this. I got this, the Deutsche Bank crops it like that. They put it like this in the report. So again, and the, the lower graph is from uh, this time is different. It's just a different one. It's not banking crisis. It's all kind of economic crisis. But again, it's the same thing. It's a flatline period. And it's not the world we live in today. Because today we live in a world that's increasingly interconnected and thus dynamic. And that changes the way we need to approach it. Because if we still approach it with this thing of this assumption of linearity, uh, it could end very badly. Why? Because the world is not necessarily complicated, it's complex. And the difference between complicated and complex is that if something is complicated, you can look at a problem for long enough and find the solution and then stick with it and then you'll be successful. That's the notion, this outdated notion of safe assets. But if you live in a complex world that's dynamic, it's constantly changing it means by the time you have found your solution, it might the right course of action might already have changed. And then to stick with that might be the most disastrous thing that you do. So in this new interconnected world, you want to place way more emphasis on, on being agile, being, being responsive, and probably also being a little bit humble because it means that sometimes you have to really quickly admit that you were wrong. So this brings us to systems thinking, because it's not just the financial sector that is more interconnected. The entire world is more interconnected. My, my hand keeps being in the wrong place. Um, so this is taken from the World Economic Forum's report, the Global uh, uh, Risks Report. They bring it out every year. For the first time, they have an environmental and a social risk at the heart of their risk map. So this is how they interact. 
It used to be more uh, of the economic and the technological ones, but for the first time it's an environmental one. And I quote from the report, the world faced a growing number of complex and interconnected challenges in 2018. From climate change and slowing global growth to economic inequality, we will struggle if we do not work together in the face of these simultaneous challenges. Over a 10 year horizon, extreme weather and climate change policy failures are seen as the gravest threats. The REF uses uh, expert elicitation to create this, uh, this risk map, by the way, which I will go into later. Um, but this is at the heart of, this, of the systems thinking, um, the iceberg. We typically tend to look at events because they're the easiest to see. But if you look a bit closely, you see that these events actually often form a certain kind of pattern. And really that pattern is just the behavior of the system. And if you can see that, if you look at the structures, but those structures are often difficult to see. So you, you have these, so um, you, you can read the whole text later. Um, but what the World Economic Forum said last year in its report, for example, is, yeah, we, we're actually very good in looking at things in isolation at the event level. Um, but we're not so competent when it comes to dealing with complex risks, so in their systemic structures, in the systems that underpin our world. There are, there are signs of strain, and when risk escapes through a complex system, the danger is not incremental damage, but a runaway collapse. So, meaning it's not linear, the response is not proportional, it can be um, in what you find as called uh, contagious. So just to quickly going back to this one, now that we have the systems thinking, this one was actually, I just wanted to point out because I thought it was interesting. It didn't appear in an economics or finance journal, it appeared in Nature. And it says ecology for bankers. Because that's the thing with the system. That's the difference between a system and a collection. It's the interaction and in the system, it is more than the sum of its parts. It starts to display a certain kind of behavior that none of the individual uh, parts could ever be by itself. So to me, this looks a little bit like a brain where these are the senses and then this, this is the brain that registers it. Um, and I thought that, I just thought it was interesting and maybe you don't see it in that, um, but I think that is kind of interesting in the sense that a system really does because it has a certain kind of behavior that is an extra on top of the parts. It almost, so it's not, a, I'm not saying that the financial sector is alive. I'm not saying that, but it does have its certain kind of behavior. And that's for some people actually quite an unpleasant realization because it means you have to let go of control. It means that there are things going on in the system that you are part of and you are influenced by, but there's only so much you can do about it because you're just a small part. So if you like to have control in life, systems thinking is uncomfortable. So I hope you're not one of those because I'm going to go into all those things that you're a part of that's, that are definitely going to influence you in your job, but that you do not necessarily, that you cannot control. You will have influence on it, um, but you won't have full control over it. Um, so the, obviously there are a lot more global risks than the, just these, but I, these are important and I think sometimes a little bit um, overlooked, even though they're very relevant, I think, for the financial sector. So the first one I'm going to do after the second question. Uh, this is the last one, so let me know. It's the, it's the same thing. Everything is identical except one thing. You earn... 150 per year, always. Prices are the same in both worlds. And everyone else earns 75,000. In world two, you earn more, so you can buy more, because prices are the same. And you earn 250,000, but everyone else earns 500,000, so twice as much. Which world do you prefer? Who prefers, with hand raising, who prefers world one? One, uh, two, three, four. Uh, is it six or seven? 
Eight. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the other is two. Can I assume that? Who prefers world, world two? Anyone? All right. Yeah, that checks out. Okay, so we still have 10 people. Nobody left yet. Great. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it, uh, it's interesting to point out, um, uh, you probably already knew this, but there's, there's quite a lot of economic evidence, empirical evidence, I should say, that um, typically high debt levels precede a crisis and also social unrest. Obviously, those are very interrelated as well. So it's interesting to note that private debt levels are back to an all-time high, at least in the US. Uh, to put it bluntly, a lot of the Western governments are broke and um, assets in central banks are at an unprecedented highs because they bought up all the assets in the global financial crisis that nobody else wanted uh, to, in order also to provide liquidity to the market. Um, so if you look at, for example, uh, here, Japan is the highest. Most of that belongs to its citizens. But if you read Carmen Reinhardt's book, that does not guarantee that it won't pay it back, uh, that it, or that it won't renege at all. Uh, there's a lot of history, actually, of governments don't, not paying back their own citizens. Um, and then, of course, there's Greece, Italy, and Portugal, still at unsustainable levels, which puts a lot of pressure on the Eurozone, of course. The United States, economic powerhouse, richest country in the world, is largest part of that, obviously, uh, is uh, owed to China. Um, and then a lot of other European countries. I do not include the UK there, because we have the Brexit. So. And then we have Canada there. So a lot of economic powerhouses that whose governments are... are highly in debt. Also, the citizens are highly in debt. Uh, this is just from the US, but it's interesting to note that we're back at uh, crisis levels when it comes to uh, consumer debt. The composition has changed slightly, so it was mostly mortgages. This time, it's less so mortgages, but I think this is a very interesting thing of, um, if you have policy at the event level, I'm not saying that it wasn't necessary, but um, what you see, they say, oh, well, okay, they gave up mortgages too easily, so we're going to make that stricter. And what you see now is that auto loans have increased, and they've started to securitize those en masse. Because that's what the financial sector does. It's its purpose. It innovates typically around the rules. So if you make them at the event level, it's going to come back another way. That's what the system does. Also, a large part of it is now student loans, which are very interesting, um, not Unless you're, you're invested a lot in the US, not so much for you. I don't think you have this. We don't have it in Europe. But uh, well, for, first of all, colleges, are, uh, the, the prices have increased immensely in the US. And student loans are not, I, in Europe, we give, the government gives them out for, at below market rates. This is not the case for student loans in the US. Also, you can never ever get rid of them. You, can, you cannot get rid of them even through filing bankruptcy or if you go into retirement. So if you go into retirement, some people do that. If they go into retirement with student loans, the government will take out cuts from your pension in order to pay back your student loan. So, uh, like I said, uh, public debt, really interestingly enough, this is for the Eurozone, but they, um, it's at an all-time high for peacetime. So it was higher during the Second World War, um, but not even that much higher. Um, and also, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's at a level of unprecedentedly low interest rates, which is zero. The, the Eurozone is still close to zero because we all stood, central banks also uh, lowered the interest rates a lot to keep the economy moving. It's the same thing for US. These are our central um, bank assets. I don't think I need to. I think they speak for themselves. So what you have basically is a very fragile situation, is my point. So you have um, our, our governments are basically out of balance. They have very high public debt and very low interest rates. And of course, how 
uh, central banks in the past used to spur on the economy in terms of crisis was by providing liquidity to the market and uh, lowering interest rates. We can't go much, we can't go any further in the euro area, we can go much further in the US. They have raised it a little bit last, uh, the last time they decided to keep it at this level. So it, it's up to, uh, they, they have a little bit more uh, way to maneuver around, but not that much. So it's a very, it's um, the very, very fragile situation that's unprecedented. These combination, this combination of circumstances, we've never experienced that before. And some say, well, maybe even this in of itself can be a cause for a crisis because we've never had this kind of quantitative easing before. So if we're now going to stop that, we don't know what's going to happen in the market. Uh, the people who say this are, uh, the people that I quote here are not neutral. They're bankers. Um, so I don't know if that's true. I think so far central banks have been very cautious with selling off their assets. They have started to, to uh, diminish their banks, uh, their, uh, their, uh, their balances a little bit. But um, I think they've been very cautious with it because obviously they're aware of the situation. I'm not saying anything they didn't know. But it, it is true that, again, it's, it's, we've never seen this kind of quantitative easing before. And it's, we don't know what's going to happen with it. And certainly in combination with um, a lot of other fragile situations. The thing also is that we're a little bit low on, in that sense, on the financial capital and financial resilience. But we're also, in other ways, running low on capital, for example, in natural capital. Um, I know this is a no-no to put so much text in there because you can't read and listen at the same time. So I'm going to ask you to listen to me and read this another time. But uh, what it comes down to is that uh, climate change poses a major financial threat. And I put this here because I think it's very well worded by the task force on climate related financial disclosures. They say that it's, it's going to be Trillions of dollars. It's a very wide range, the estimate, because again, it's unprecedented. So this, it would be an illusion to say, well, this is how much risk it is. Um, I think they're just being intellectually honest and say, well, but you know, uh, it's going to be roughly between four to forty-three trillion. The point is that it's going to be a lot, and you will not be able to divest from it because it's everywhere. It's going to impact the entire economy. I'm not going to linger too much on this because you are actually quite aware of uh, asset managers in New Zealand and Australia uh, are the most aware of in the world on this. The majority of you knows this. They work with it. They do their own things with it. Uh, after that, it's the European asset managers. After that, the US and then the rest of the world. So we're going to go to energy, which is obviously very much related. And there are two things about energy. If you have, if you're talking about uh, fossil fuel uh, generated energy, obviously there's a scarcity issue. We're running out of it. We have all these things about peak oil. Interesting thing is that really, if we, well, basically what people say sometimes is we're gonna, especially when it comes to coal, we're gonna run out of clean air and clean water before we run out of coal. So. Um, we, it's not necessarily that we will hit the limit of climate change before we hit limit um, of, of uh, fossil fuels. It's not a problem because without subsidy, especially wind and solar generated energy is already cheaper than uh, fossil fuel generated energy. It depends, this is globally, uh, it depends obviously a little bit on, on local circumstances, but globally this is true. But why I say this is that there are enormous, in, often implicit government subsidies still on fossil fuels, about six and a half percent of global GDP. Often in, um, in not direct subsidies, but tax cuts, implicit government uh, guarantees, that sort of thing. So we can expect most countries to take those away because they are, com they have committed themselves to the uh, Paris, uh, the climate agreement. So, um, there, there's actually more risk in that sense of stranded assets, that you invested in something that will stay in the ground in the future. Um, but of course, uh, there are also enormous opportunities here in wind and solar. Um, biomass is a little bit riskier, 
So uh, not for pension funds or anything, maybe for more private property. But uh, very interesting stuff there, especially with um, uh, biomass from, um, from algae. So um, lots of interesting stuff going on there. I think you're aware of that. What some um, financial managers are not aware of yet is the water crisis that we're approaching pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so uh, we are, the UN estimates that two thirds of the people globally, two out of three, will experience water stress by 2025, so that's in six years. And um, about 40% will suffer water shortage by 2045. So when you suffer shortage, um, you cannot, you don't have enough water for your basic needs. So you can see how that creates a little bit of um, social unrest. So this is from the US National Intelligence Council in a report and they say, during the next 10 years, many countries important to the US will experience water problems, shortages, poor water quality or floods that will risk instability and state failure and increase regional tensions. Between now and 2040, fresh water availability will not keep up with demand, absent more effective management of water resources. Water problems will hinder the ability of key countries to produce food and generate energy. Key here is uh, absent more effective management because we are incredibly wasteful with water. Right now, it's really, if you think about it, it's ridiculous that we flush our toilets with potable water. Uh, most of the water in the world is salt, so we cannot use it. It's a very small part of, of the water in the world is fresh. Um, but obviously, again, a lot of opportunity here as well. Desalinization is, those might just be the Googles of the future. Um, what, there's incredibly a uh, lot of stuff uh, going on in water reclamation, so filtering it again, because um, um, that's going to be necessary because water is finite. It has some regenerative uh, uh, capabilities, of course, through the hydrological cycle, but that, that absorption capacity for waste is also finite. And you can see how with a growing population, a population that's growing exponentially, um, that's going to be a problem. Also, not just the population is increasing exponentially, but our water use is increasing faster than the population is growing. So it's, our water use is going up by about, uh, about twice the rate. So again, it's a very non-linear growth, which is why people say, especially uh, some people in the Middle East like already say, the new oil is water. And people fear that new wars in the future will be fought over water. About 70% of the world's water use actually goes to food, yet we throw away right now about a third globally of what we produce. We throw away about 40% in the US. And again, food is renewable, we can grow it, but everything that it takes to grow food is finite. So it takes water, it takes land, obviously that's finite. It, um, it's not just land, it needs to be arable land. Uh, that is actually slowly decreasing uh, for a number of reasons, uh, mismanagement, also as a result of climate change. And I find it very interesting that only since recently the hunger rate in the world has gone up again. There's a link there also with, um, with our diets, so those are changing as well. Obviously, some, still millions of people are li being lifted out of poverty. Um, especially in Asia, and what you see is then the middle class, they, they want to have, they change their diets, they want to eat meat. And that's a luxury, that's a, it's almost a status symbol. The thing is that it takes so much more energy, land and water to produce uh, a certain amount of meat compared to vegetables or rice, that sort of thing. It takes about, um, to create one kilogram of corn, it takes about 900 liters of water. To create one, to produce, I should say, uh, one kilogram of beef, it takes about 15,500 liters of water. Um, this is why in places where I live, Los Angeles, it's become, again, a status thing um, to be vegan because it places so much less demand on, um, on our environment. 
it, meat industry is the number one contributor to climate change right now. And the, the, the meat that contributes by far the most is beef. So even if you don't want to become a vegetarian, um, you could cut down on your beef and just uh, focus on the chicken, that sort of thing. That already would make a huge difference. But globally, so that's what you see in the West, you see many people turning vegetarian, but globally, uh, we still see an increase in, um, in this kind of, uh, in, in, in meat, in that kind of diet. So this is my point of, again, of the interconnectedness. You can see how all of these things interconnect and produce non-linear behavior. It takes an enormous amount uh, of water to create energy, especially from fossil fuels, uh, fracking. Um, it uses enormous amount of water. It also co typically contaminates some water, just some of the gas seeps into the groundwater. This is why some people in the US can set their water on fire. Um, and then it takes also a lot of energy to transport water and to reclaim water and to, uh, to clean it. It takes a lot of water to grow food again. Um, it also takes a lot of energy to grow food. Um, so that sort of, and all of that is obviously impacted by climate change. So last week, US uh, intelligence officials, uh, they brought out a worldwide threat assessment report and they said climate hazards are intensifying they're threatening infrastructure, health, and water, and food security. The US intelligence community also warned that climate change and other kinds of environmental degradation pose risks to global stability because they are, quote, likely to fuel competition for resources, economic distress, and social discontent through 2019 and beyond. So, speaking of social discontent, According to um, all these, or these organizations like IMF and OECD, World Bank, um, income and wealth and inequality is the defining issue of our time. I find it very interesting because it has so many systemic channels through which it operates. It, it's intangible, you can't really see it, but you see its effects everywhere. Um, so, you see it, and maybe this is also because I'm, I'm Dutch, so I come from a relatively socialist country, and then I come to the US and I see, maybe I, I see it a little bit better because I, I haven't grown up here. Because the US is the, has the highest income inequality of the developed economies. It's um, certainly worse in developing countries. Um, but the United States, um, has the highest income inequality. If you look at this thing here, you it has been growing consistently. It has been growing everywhere, also in New Zealand and in all the Western countries. It's, it's been growing. Uh, it's also been growing, so it's been growing domestically, it's also growing internationally. So the richer countries are getting richer, while the poorest countries are, are they're not progressing at all. They're just they're, they're stuck in a poverty trap. Obviously, there's some countries, especially in Asia, that are growing, but the poorest are staying there. Um, here in the US, the domestically, the, the, the bottom 50%, their share of what they take home from the total GDP has been going down, which is basically translates into a losing purchasing power. So the poor are getting poor. It has been this way for the past half century. The middle class is very small compared to other countries. There's a strong correlation between uh, so, uh, income, economic inequality, and social problems. And that's why you see that the US is pretty high up here, and it's high indication of social problems. And you can see how you are here, you're somewhere in the middle, and you see that very, the, the socialist countries, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, all, the, all those cold Scandinavian countries, as well as Japan, um, they're, they're, they're much lower there. Um, the life expectancy for Americans has gone down for three consecutive years now. I find, I find that very interesting, that we have a country that is the richest country in the history of the world, and its citizens have stopped to increase their lifespan overall, on average. All right, so you don't have to agree with everything about it um, but the thing is that what why is it not going to oh there we are 
Um, but the, especially the channels that they mentioned, so the economic channels, the fact that it creates social unrest, um, the fact that the middle class, really what they say is the middle class is the tr true job creator because they are buying all the goods. It's not the wealthy elite that spend a lot. In fact, they spend a lot outside of the country. Um, so one thing that wasn't mentioned is that there's also a strong correlation between environmental degradation and income inequality. And it's very interesting. For some reason, even in very rich countries, uh, people aren't willing to pay as much for environmental protection if there's a lot of income inequality compared to rich countries, say Norway, uh, that have uh, a lot of equality, relative equality. And the going theory is that when you have a lot of income inequality, people are social animals, right? So when you have a lot of income inequality, there's a lot more pressure to show which class you are. So people spend a lot more of their income on material, dis material displays of wealth. So you, you saw that here in California, for example, when we had the drought, we had years of drought and the governor said, okay, you gotta have to stop watering your lawn. That's not a first need. You just kind of have to let it go brown. And there were fines on it. And most people did that, but some celebrities and people in Beverly Hills, they started shipping in water from outside of the country just to keep their lawns green because now it had become a status symbol to have a green lawn. So that's the kind of thing that you see um, in, uh, that I find very interesting with income inequality. And obviously the productive side, uh, it makes a lot of sense, right? If, if you have a large part of the population that struggles to get a proper education and struggles to stay healthy, it's gonna impact productivity. That, that shouldn't come as a surprise. So that's why recent analysis of the IMF and the OECD finds that really more often than not, an increase in income and in share of the income for the top 20% does not translate into um, prolonged and medium term growth. On the, in contrast, they do find that if you increase the income share of the bottom 20%, that you do see more growth, which makes sense for all the other reasons that we just talked about. It, they can actually buy the things, they can actually stay healthy, etc. So they did this analysis. I thought it was very interesting. It's not always. There are a few exceptions. You see in Spain that there was a positive. They found a positive impact from inequality in Ireland as well. But most countries, including New Zealand, you know, you could have had a higher growth these past uh, decades, basically, if you didn't have uh, your income inequality. It's the same for um, the Netherlands. Um, in Mexico, for example, Mexico has high income inequality. It completely nulled its economic growth. So um, the question then is, why does it keep rising? If we have this and it doesn't make economic sense, why is it still rising? And the thing is, it's because it's so full of all these, it's nonlinear, it's full of all these reinforcing loops. Um, and it's called in uh, systems thinking, an archetype to success to the successful. This always, this archetype, this process basically, uh, pops up whenever you have a situation where uh, people are competing for a limited resource and the chance of success in obtaining most of the resource depends on your current level of success. So one very important one that Piketty found, of course, in his uh, capital in the 21st century, was that the in return on financial investment is higher than the return on labor. So if you are already rich, you get most of your income from investments. And what do you do? Well, you invest at least part of it, and probably most of it, in developing countries, because the, the, those are still developing economies, so the return on investment is higher. But that goes at the cost of domestic investments, which is why the average wages haven't increased because it's not, there's, there's not enough investment in the, in the Western societies to keep going. Um, so if you are in that class where you get most of your income from labor, um, that it's, then you don't see your income increase as much as wealthy people. So you have this, uh, this reinforcing loop where you stay in, lower or middle class. You have this with a lot of things. Um, education, it's um, especially in the US where there's not a lot of funds for public education. Um, if you come from a wealthy family, you can 
you have a better chance of getting into a good college and you have a better chance of getting a good paying job and the cycle continues and of course it's not that great for people who don't have the income to go to a good college etc it still happens uh, these are not these are just uh, archetypes it still happens that you can beat the system it's just that the system doesn't work with you so obviously the government has many ways to counteract uh, this this uh, this archetype this mechanism the problem is as we saw in the video already it does make it easier if you have a very wealthy elite to buy politicians so that erodes democracy from the top down but actually there's also an erosion from the bottom up which have for some uh, reason and I can't go into psychology and behavioral stuff too much because I only have an hour but what uh, what scientists find is that there's a large correlation between people who grow up in an environment with high income inequality and who then also behave in um, sexist, racist, and uh, homophobic ways. So they also almost start to enforce social inequalities. Um, there, there's also this loss of trust um, in, in institutions, in government, um, they, they, they feel that the elite has lost touch with them, uh, and I'm not saying that they're wrong, uh, but it does make them vulnerable to populism, which throughout history typically doesn't counteract income inequality. Um, if, you, if you look at the effects of the, the, the policies that they, that they create, they typically don't reduce inequalities. Um, it's interesting to note that populism index in, um, in Europe is now at the same, uh, at an all time high and the same high as around the world, the Second World War. And a lot of this um, analysts find is very much linked to income inequality because people are upset, they feel that the system isn't working for them, they're right, and they don't always know. Um, there's, there's this Average, there's this overall idea that there's a loss of truth, a loss of trust, uh, also a loss, uh, loss of truth, really. Uh, they don't believe, maybe um, some, some of them start to believe that some things are fake news. Um, and, then, and then, of course, you have this, if you can't agree on what is fact, uh, it's, you, you're losing social capital. So people's ability to work together in an economy, which again is a is syst it's a systemic, it's very influential. Corruption and the loss of trust between people has very very large implications for an economy. But it's it's systemic and it's very intangible. I'm not going to go into this because I don't have time. But I made this just to see just to see how all these things interact. So if you want to study it, I I put that paper online so that it's there in the link. If you, if you want to study it. But it's, it, it's a, again, it's a very interesting, income inequality is a very interesting thing that goes through all kinds of uh, economic and social, behavioral, political, and environmental channels, and overall reinforces itself. And again, it's unsustainable. So lastly, there's this interesting thing, and now, now, we're, going, now we're going deep. Uh, in the 1970s, the Club of Rome asked a group of MIT people to model the world. And this was not a linear model. It was a world model. It was a, it was a model of the world. It was called World 3. And it was a dynamic systems model. So it was the global interactions between natural resources, finite resources, industrial output, population, food, and pollution. And then they mapped that. And, and mapped how that would, uh, would impact human welfare, so standards of living. And they found that if we kept up this, um, that at one point, at first, like we had in the past, with economic growth, with GDP growth, our standards of living around the world would increase. But they said at one point, we will reach um, that point where natural capital is starting to become a limiting factor because it's finite. So there will be a delay. That's what this, this dashed line means. But after a delay, you will see that standards of living will no longer increase. At one point, it will start to decrease. So they ran a couple of scenarios with this uh, dynamic systems model. 
there were many, and not all ended in collapse, but some of them did. And one of them was the business as usual scenario, so where they just took historic uh, figures and, and assumed nothing on top of that. And that one shows a slowdown of standards of living around now and a subsequent steep reversal in about a decade from now. So that reversal is what they call collapse. I don't do that because people, when I say collapse, people think we're all gonna die, which is not what it means, but our standards of living will go down. And according to this scenario, the population for the first time in the history of humankind will start to decrease because mortality will go up. So here's the thing, it got a lot of criticism, but, empiric, but it was published first in 1972. So we now have four decades of empirical da data that we can compare it with. So a couple of people have done that. The last one uh, that did it was a professor of the University of Melbourne in 2014. And he had to conclude that world data actually very closely, very accurately, uh, uh, very closely aligned with the business as usual scenario. So I should say that he has retired and so I am planning on, this is what I'm writing my thesis on, I am planning to do another update because I thought this was interesting. So the next data comparison is going to come from me, so yeah, I should say that because I, I'm, I'm, I'm linked to this subject. And sometimes when I say this to people, they think I'm a pessimist, um, and I and and they uh, they say, well, that's that's a bit too enthusiastic. You're you're a doomsayer. I didn't think you were a pessimist. And I'm like, I don't. I'm not really sure. I think I'm a realist, and I think this is what scientists do. It's not that I looked at the Mayan calendar and saw that it only went to 2012, and then thought, oh well, basically that means that the world's going to come to an end. We're, we're doing scientific research, we look at data, we have a model that predicted 40 years into the future. I've worked in finance, I've studied econometrics, I have never seen a model that could predict accurately 40 years into the future. So I think that's pretty impressive. Um, and it's not, um, it's not a doomsday, it's a, I think it warrants a warning and it's, a, it's an urge for action. So how would we do that? Let me move my head again. Uh, so I think, I hope that basically what all that I've been saying flows naturally into these methods. Basically, we, we have to look at events uh, and, or risks or anything, opportunities in a network and in the system. Because if we don't, we're, gonna, we're not going to be effective. We're not going to get real change. We're not going to be innovative enough. And we need to do, we change the way we do some things. Uh, we need to be, we cannot assume constancy, we have to let go of this illusion of certainty and precision. There's, there's no such thing, we have to be nimble. Um, we want to be focused on getting it accurate, it doesn't have to be super precise, but a little bit in the right direction is okay. That's good enough, as long as it's forward looking and you know where you're going. So how do you do that in practice? Um, there are a couple of tools that have been emerging that we use KPMG and that some uh, financial, uh, the many in financial institutions already are using. Certainly scenario analysis uh, is, is not new to you. Expert elicitation, that's also what the World Economic Forum uses for its global risks report. You take, it's basically harvesting the, the wisdom of the crowd. So science tells us that the average expert is about as accurate as a dart throwing chimpanzee. We've known that for a couple of years now. And it also shows that even if you have a genius expert, just her is still not as accurate as a group of experts, even mediocre experts. So expert elicitation is it takes a group of people, each with their own uh, field of expertise, that it needs to be diverse, and uh, because you want to have all kinds of, uh, of uh, 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 all kinds of, of, of knowledge from all different kinds of viewpoints, and then you average that out. So that's what we use to create our network. That's what we do. It's what I do at KPMG. So we use expert elicitation to create a network, just like the the web did it for their uh, global risks. 
And um, then you can apply to that mathematics, which is what I do. Um, and then you can start to capitalize on contagion. So instead of being overwhelmed by it, you can actually also use the fact that things can spread through a network. Once you know the network, you can make use of it because then you get what we in America call the best, the most bang for your buck, people like that. So um, you press on these kind of leverage points as we call it, and then it spreads through the system and indirectly you mitigate a risk um, also in another part of the network or you, you capitalize on the opportunity indirectly. And then, on top of that, we have system dynamics modeling, which is basically uh, a network is a snapshot in time of a system and system dynamics modeling adds to that the, uh, the dimension of time. Each of these, uh, you could go into that for a whole weekend at least, and system dynamics modeling is entire, a different uh, scientific field. So you could certainly, uh, I can't go into it now, but I did, include two links. One is uh, the KPMG brochure on how we use this network thinking um, to model sustainability risks, for example, climate change, but other things as well. And then I wrote a KPMG paper for a UN report that's going to be released next week, um, which you can already access it here, because we also use network analysis for corporations to analyze which sustainable development goals they should work on, because we have 17 SDGs and you want to be able to focus on, let's say, two or three. So you can do that if you look for the leverage points. And I, so we do that for corporations, but I really wanted to give it to governments as well. So I asked my boss, can we maybe deliver it against a discount? And he said, okay, well, we'll, we'll write it up to charity. So we gave it, at a, I offered it for a 90% discount and they could still not afford it because their governments are broke. So I wrote a do-it-yourself paper and that's that. But So you can use it, it's written for governments, but you can use it as well and you can also apply it to um, something else in the SDGs. So this is what we do. Um, you know the left one, uh, impact likelihood, and then you focus on the purple ones. But then if you put it in a network, you see that some risks, like I said, are very central, meaning they're leverage points. And if you press there, then uh, they, they, they cause, they trigger a lot of other risks or events. So typically you would not look at this green one, for example, because it's relatively small impact and likelihood. But because if you look at it in a network, oh, it actually triggers a lot of other ones. And combined, they probably have a bigger impact than that one purple one. So this is what we do, and we get this network from expert elicitation. But I don't want this to become a marketing gig. So we're moving on to um, what you can do in your job. Um, and I think especially businesses in general can cannot uh, afford to ignore this increasing fragile and dynamic business environment. And I think especially if you think at the financial sector, um, people are going to look at you. There's a reason that the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement was on Wall Street, if we're going to look at you, or what are you going to do with this, um, this income inequality? So these questions that you have to ask yourself is, well, how, so how can we uh, adapt to this fragile environment? Could we play a role in counteracting this trend? Can we do it and should we do it? And especially where lie the opportunities in all of this? Because there are opportunities. Because if you think about it, you basically see a consumer market bifurcation. If the middle class is disappearing, you just basically have the upper class and the lower class. So the upper class is already catered to uh, there's a lot of competition there. There's a lot of margins, high, high margins to be made, but also a lot of, uh, a lot of competition, and of course, in labor intense products, because they want it tailored to their specific needs. Then what is really, um, what, where a lot of opportunity probably lies is the unbanked and the underbanked. Globally, about 2 billion people do not have bank accounts. And the reason is that they don't make enough money for to be worth the time it takes to for a clerk to identify you and help you set up your account but now with new technological developments like internet of things and um and blockchain mobile payments that is changing so there's a lot of opportunity um basically in financial inclusion it's called the bottom of the pyramid very very low margins but because it's such a broad base still a lot of money to be made 
if you do it right, with a little bit of creativity and a lot of technological development that we have now. Um, so in the US, we, have, we still have about 6.5% uh, of households that do not have a bank account, which I think is pretty, pretty crazy. Um, but I'm going to go over this because I, unless you work at a big financial institution that maybe is also interested in growing in countries like India and China, there are large opportunities there. Um, this is not so interesting for you because you don't have unbanked people in New Zealand. I looked it up and so you are very financial inclusive. I only found one article and that was another economist complaining that he couldn't find unbanked people in New Zealand for his research. So good on you. This is going to be interesting though. Um, Environmental social governments investing, ESG investing. Um, there, if you invest in certain kind of companies, um, you need to be aware of this kind of thing, of ESG, because they have a financial impact, a significant one, uh, a positive one. So if you if you perform well uh, on, on the ESG factors, typically you have reduced legal risk, uh, you have a better reputation, so you attract uh, more talent, which is imperative because you want to have that talent because you need to be innovative. In, a, in, in general, in a dynamic situation, you need to have people that are open, that are switched on, um, that, um, that have this sensing capacity of what you need to do next. That you can't attract that talent if you don't, uh, if, if you have a reputation of trashing the, the environment uh, or, uh, or the lowest incomes. People will not stay at your company. Um, and of course, you can charge a premium. Any companies do that. If, you're, if, you're, if you say, I'm, I'm green, they, people will pay for that. So again, uh, water reclamation, those kind of companies, is, there's, there's a lot of interesting things to be done there. And the thing is, it, it used to be that people say, um, I have heard that about 10 years ago, you would, you would hear asset managers say, but I have a fiduciary duty. I need to look at the financial performance. But really what it is, is that contrary to um, perception in some places, maybe not so much in New Zealand, but probably you can still find a few people there too. Um, we think that uh, it's, it's, it goes against your fiduciary duty. It's actually the opposite. So companies that score high on ESG, outperform traditional competitors. So it's not, can I do this within my fiduciary duty? No, you cannot not look at this and fulfill your fiduciary duty. That's how simple it is. That's how in, in, um, in America we call this uh, impact investing because they're still relatively speaking, more people think that anything with environment in it is expensive. So they call it impact investment because that's how strong. But um, the truth is that if you're environmentally conscious, you're probably a stronger performer than your competitors. How are you doing over there? I think I'm already at um, at an hour. Are you? Are you? Are you? How are they looking over there, Melanie? Are you still? Are you ready to go even deeper for another ten minutes? Yeah, ten minutes. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen. <laughs> All right. All right. So we're going to go deeper then because the iceberg actually goes a little bit deeper. So if you go beyond the structures, there's mental models. And these are very tacit. Um, they're even hard to put into words often, but they shape the structures that we create. So this is the, from the book, uh, this is from a, a, a memoir of Don Donella Meadows, who is one of the MIT people um, on the team from Limits to Growth. And, and she describes how the club asked them in 1970 to look at these, what they called the continuous critical problems, poverty, war, pollution, drug addiction, all these things that we still have. And they say, presumably these problems are interrelated, but how? Are there fundamental underlying causes? So they looked into it and then she writes, in the Optiland wood paneled conference room, we told the club, there is a primary cause of the continuous critical problems. It is growth, exponential growth of energy use, material flows and population against the earth's physical limits. That which all the world sees as a solution to its problems is in fact a cause of those problems. If the land limit is pushed back, for example, by producing food in greater yield, 
that will require more energy and bring the system to energy limits. If those are overcome, there are limits to the Earth's ability to absorb pollution. The human system simply cannot allocate capital and technology to all sectors at once and keep pushing back all limits at the same time. The limits to physical expansion of the human economy are flexible, dynamic, and interconnected. Some are being pushed upward by technology and some are being eroded downward by the overload and mismanagement and waste. We don't know where they are, but we do know that on a finite planet limits are inevitable. If we evade one and continue growing, we will run into another. We don't have the option to grow forever. Our only option is to choose our own limits or let nature choose them for us. The club members listened politely, spoke kind words, and then went back to their discussion of the world's problems as if each was unrelated to all the others and as if there were no limits. So, I would argue that if you go even deeper, we probably would need to change some of our values. And you see that happening already, um, especially with millennials, we go from where you go from, ex you can still look at growth, you can still desire growth, but you would have to look at it, not expansion, but as development. Um, you see this a lot with the sharing economy, for example, wealth is no longer material ownership so much as it is experiences and health and connection uh, and knowledge. Um, success and power, for example, is really this old style thinking as well as crushing your comp competition, this domination of the market, and now you see these social media influencers. We really don't have any control over anybody else, but they still have a lot of power in their influence and those kind of things. So um, when I say this, typically people think, okay, that may, it may be some of you, uh, I, I don't know. But many people say, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that sounds, yeah, we have got to do this. But the thing is that this growth, is a, this mental model is very deeply rooted in our minds. So now if we go back to your, uh, to the questions and to your answers, you are clearly schooled in the thinking of the homo economicus because most people in question one, um, they opt for world one. So um, some of you still wanted world one, but most of you, uh, vote, six of you voted for world two which is obviously what a homo economicus would do, because no one is saying that you need to spend that 50,000 that year. Basically, the only difference is, do you have 50,000 now or in the future? And everybody knows that 50,000 now is worth more than 50,000 next year. That's why you have a discount rate. Still, and, and I, you all know this, you've all been schooled in this, yet four out of 10, 40%, still voted for World One. And that's probably because you feel that you want to see growth in your salary. You want to see, that's typically what, typically people, the majority answers world one. And it's because when they go into it, they say, well, I would feel less about myself if I went down in income. So that's the thing. This concept of growth, is, it go, it's not just a concept that, it's outside of it. It goes to, typically to our ideals. It's, it's also rooted in the American dream. Um, tomorrow is gonna to be better. And my life is gonna see improvement in the future. It goes to our self-worth. And that's also what's behind the overwhelming majority of you voting for world, um, uh, voting for world one. You have less there. You can purchase less. But it doesn't matter because you can still purchase more than all of your neighbors. So that's good. It doesn't, it's not about the absolute level of income. It's about how you compare to others. Again, it's about your self-worth. If you make half that all the other people, you feel bad about yourself, even though it's a six-figure income. And this is what everybody does this. I do, I do the same thing. I have that. It's, it's just to point out that these things are very deeply rooted in us. And if we really are to change the things that we do and look at our systems in a meaningful way, we have to also take into account these, these very personal things. So lastly, a couple of uh, this is also, you can see that in some leaders on the forefront, 
your president is one. She made an enormous splash at Deva, da Davos. Uh, uh, people, all, all, people everywhere are talking about her. Um, a lot of people in Los Angeles are very jealous of your president. Um, other, other leaders do this as well. Bhutan has been governing by a happiness index for a very long time. They have set uh, a cap on income inequality. They just said, this is the maximum that we want to have in our country. Um, European, European Union uh, it sends out a, sur a quality survey, meaning um, they ask things like, how satisfied are you with your life? How satisfied are you with society, people around you, that sort of thing. Ecuador has put uh, rights of mother nature in its constitution since 2008, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and they've defined it as a, not a property, but as having the right to exist, persist, maintain, and regenerate its vital cycles. It also states that we the people have the legal authority to enforce these rights on behalf of ecosystems. And this comes from the notion of Gran Vivir, which is good living, which is rooted in the world view of South American indigenous people. And I think it's a really good example of how if you let everybody, a diverse group of people, everybody in your society have a voice at the table, you, you get sensible laws. And lastly, I think Elon Musk last week released all its patents for, uh, for its cars. So everybody can now use Tesla's technology to build an electric car. And I think this is, this is also a prime example, and I don't even like him so much, I think he's a bit megalomaniac, but uh, I just, still, it's undeniably a, a, a show of leadership of the future. So this new corporate leadership where you define your company as its, its prime purpose of your company is to provide value to the world. And then you trust that they will reward you with profits. Because you can't really blame Tesla for putting profits first, because most of the time they haven't made any profits. They, they had a profit last year um, in the third quarter um, of 2018, and that was the first time in two years that they made a profit. But still, he's a billionaire. So um, I think that's, uh, and then what he said was, well, he gave the reason is it's impossible for Tesla to build electric cars fast enough to address the carbon crisis. So he just released it. I think that's a very good example. So that was it. Thank you for sticking with me. Um, are there any questions for me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. A few slides back for a dynamic assessment um, yes. diagram. Um, and you're looking at um, uh, likelihood of risk and potential impact. Um, uh, but not, but if you look at it, uh, yeah, thank you, that one there. Is there a is there a paper that explores that in more detail? Oh yeah, yes, yeah, we have lots of them. We work with financial institutions a lot because they, well, after the GFC, they kind of got it. Um, so we do this a lot with the financial institutions. There is this one, the link one here is about sustainability risks, but uh, we we actually started with doing this um, just with financial risks. So we have. A lot of experience in that well so um, I could certainly if you if you email me I could certainly send you a couple of other links to that yeah I have a, uh, you talk about uh, interconnectedness and uh, you have a master's in econometrics and I'm sure you're aware that we have this neural Netflix with the non-linear models and with, uh, the software that we have today, you just plug in the data and it finds the relationship and it throws you out in pictures or graphs or whatever. So mapping the interconnectedness between you know, systems and data is more readily available today than what it was in the 70s. And, uh, are you seeing people employing the technology, uh, the non-linear models to find the uh, Right. So, yeah, I'm having a bit hard, hard time hearing you, but I think I understood what you said. You said, um, so we have a lot of, we have uh, new models that are non-linear. 
and um, you, you can put data in and then they uh, produce graphs and show all this interconnectedness and uh, clusters and that kind of thing, centrality, I'm assuming. Yeah, so that's, that's absolutely true. Um, I don't know if, I think I've seen it a lot with, um, like I said, with network analysis of, um, for example, you see it a whole lot in social media, obviously. That's so, there are a lot of companies that do this already. Um, in the financial sector, you certainly see the regulators do it um, for uh, between banks, interconnectivity between banks. Um, I haven't seen it used for, uh, particularly for events that much. So you can put in data and it does the analysis. Uh, I'm sure it does, but I don't, I don't see it uh, used for, um, uh, for this kind of assessment yet. And I think the reason for that is that it needs to have, like you said, it needs data in there. And there are two parts in this. It is the interconnectedness part, but also the non-constancy part. So if you put in just any data uh, and then you take it out and then you have output, um, I mean, a anybody can draw lines between nodes, right? So it's not just, um, can you make a network? But can you make a network that makes sense, for example, if you want to set your strategy for future risk management? So if you use, let's say, even if you use past data on how risks were interconnected, um, that's still not to say that it's going to be useful for the future, because the other part of what I was talking about is we are, because of this interconnectedness, things are very dynamic. So we need to be forward looking. So you can't just construct a network from an Excel sheet. You need to use expert elicitation because human beings are the only ones who can actually look into the future. That is something, a very special skill. We're not that impressive in many other ways compared to other animals. We're not that strong, not that fast. We certainly can't bite much, but we have this prefrontal cortex, uh, this lobe where we can imagine things that have never happened before. So in a world where you face unprecedented challenges, you need to work with humans to create that network. And then you can do all this analysis that I think you're saying. You can make all these graphs. We do that. We do that at 3D. Uh, our clients really like it. And they, they go into the room and they, they squeeze this little event here and, and they see it flow through the network. But all of that we can only do once we have used their internal experts to create the network. Otherwise, it's just a couple of notes with lines in between them, to put it disrespectfully. Does that answer your question? Right, well, I think I think that's it, Guy. Thank you very much uh, for your. Yeah, time. you're very welcome.